All right, I think we're ready. Let's go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. My name is Chris Alamo. And I'm Ben Gasway. Together, we are The Amateur Investors. This podcast is our open source journal of everything we learn about investing and wealth management. We're here to explore the key concepts, market dynamics, and investing strategies that will assist you on the path toward financial independence and financial literacy. Our mission is to build us up from amateurs to experts. All suggestions are our own, and we recommend that you do your own research before taking any investment advice. See you in this week's episode. We hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Amateur Investors. This week I will be talking to Chris Reed from the Level Up Experience. Uh, before I get into Chris's background, uh, I just want a quick shout out to our sponsor. Uh, we're sponsored by Coinbeast Media. Uh, you can find them at coinbeast.com. They have a wealth of all things Bitcoin on their website from articles and links from where to buy Bitcoin, what are the best hot and cold wallets, uh, what are for self custodying your Bitcoin, the potential risks of Bitcoin, and much more. It has been a pleasure partnering with them, and uh, we really look forward to bringing about an episode a month with the, uh, in partnership with a lot of their pros for the next couple months. So please check out latest episode with Adam O, aka Denver Bitcoin, about Bitcoin mining. That was episode 41. So this is episode 43. So just check back two episodes. It was a great episode with Ben and I and Adam. All right. So we're on, uh, we were on Chris's show, The Level Up Experience, back in the middle of June. We highly recommend you go back and check it out. Chris, when, do you know when that came out? I know that came out a couple of days later after we were on. Yeah, so we did a live stream um, that was pushed to the YouTube channel as well as on uh, LinkedIn and on Twitter, uh, and then it was uploaded the next day. Yeah, so we highly recommend you, you go in there. Uh, ben and I were obviously advocating for Bitcoin. You know, it seems to be all the rage and all the talk in the investing markets, or at least a lot of circles that I follow. So Chris, I just kind of want to hear your origin story about what made you get started with the level of experience, and then what kind of led you to investing, and then we'll kind of go down that path. Yeah, I got, I got to go back to, um, actually go back to when I was, I think it was 18 or 19 years old. Uh, my stepfather tells, tells me, um, you need to go open up a Roth IRA. And I'm like, I'm like uh, what is that? You know, so this was, I mean, I'm kind of dating myself here, but this was uh, like 2005, 2004, 2005. Um, so that was like the, like the first time I really started taking it somewhat serious. Mm -hmm. um, and if you've been following the markets, um, you know, if, if with any amount of time, uh, you know, just a few years later was the, the, the GFC, the great financial crisis. And um, you know, it, I really didn't pay a whole lot, you know, just kind of a DCA into the market and, um, quite frankly, didn't know a ton. I just knew, I just needed to save essentially, uh, not really sure why, uh, we can get to get, get into that a little bit later, but then a weight hit. And then you really started paying attention when your retirement was down by 50%, <laughs> you know, and you're like, okay, I got to really like, kind of figure out what's going on here. Um, and I uh, just, just starting to learn more. So I think that's what 2008 taught a lot of people. It's like, okay, what is happening to the markets? Like, you know, not just because, you know, your value was down 50 or 60%, but why it was happening. And then just trying to educate yourself on just, you know, you know, hedging and all the different other things that you can get into outside of just DCAing and forgetting. So, um, yeah, yeah 2008, which is a very interesting time. Yeah, and I know Ben and I mentioned before, DCA, uh, I know it's a term we throw around a lot, just stands for dollar cost average. So it means just buying on regular periods, whether it's weekly, monthly, daily, whatever it may be, just mm -hmm. the same amount of money each time. Obviously, upping your allocation is better or you know worse if you have the money. Uh, I kind of have a very similar experience. I know my dad, he's a computer scientist, but, you know, works for AT&T. Uh, he's more, very much a techie guy, but I always used to joke, me and my siblings, that he could have been a financial advisor in his second life or second career. And I, from the time I was like eight or nine, you know, doing like odd jobs and allowance, my dad was like teaching me like, you know, if, you, if I give you $5, you know, this is what tax is, I'm going to take a dollar. I'm like, wait, wait, what do you mean you take a dollar? He's like, well, that's what the government's going to do. Luckily, he was nice enough to just do that for one week. Um, uh, and then, you know, eventually I learned the hard way when I got a real job a few years later and, uh, you know, I'm a W-2 employee and you actually see the money coming out of your paycheck. But going along with that, I know when I was like 12 years old, he's like, oh, tell me about Roth IRAs and 401ks. And if you get 10% return or 8% return averaging, this is how long it takes to double your money and all mm -hmm. that. And, you know, I guess it, what ultimately led to me becoming really in, interested in investing uh, once I got right out of college, you're like, I'm making more money than I've ever made before. Like, how do I put this money to use? Um, and it's even something my dad noted, which I didn't really remember. But once I started doing this podcast, he's like, I used to go to Boy Scout camp 
And part of it was they give you an allotment of like $50 for the week. And we were at a Boy Scout camp that was, you go to the camp, you know, you do many activities um, and all that. And every day you get about $7 or $8 and you could go to the shop or, or the, uh, you know, the local shop on site and buy stuff, whether it's candy, soda, whatever you want. And I said to my dad, is like, if I don't use any of this, can I keep it? My dad's like, absolutely. And he was kind of like, it almost like he saw in real time the, the marshmallow experiment, you know, with the little kid, like they leave one marshmallow mm -hmm. and the scientist says, if I come back in 15 minutes and you haven't eaten it, I'll give you another one. And my dad said he knew from a very early age that I kind of like grasped that concept because I would never spend it. So I went to summer camp from like time of like 11 to 16. And he said, every summer, I, I, didn't, I didn't spend a single dime of it. And ultimately, I ended up taking that and then buying other things or doing other things. Had I known, I wish I opened up a Roth IRA or 401k or done something to actually invest that money. Uh, like Warren Buffett's quote, like, why'd you start investing at 11? He's like, because I didn't learn it, about it till at, at 10 or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, I, that was probably the first time that I really started taking it serious. Um, and then started asking, you know, just general questions about the market. Um, and then, you know, 2009, 2010, that's when I started, um, I graduated college, uh, was in exercise science. I've, always, I've uh, wrestled in high school, coached for a decade. So many wrestlers out there, MMA people, shout out to everybody. I know it's obviously MMA has exploded in the last few years. So that's been awesome to see the last, you know, five or 10 years. Um, but then it's kind of transitioned into um, just, again, asking more deeper questions about the market. I still continue to kind of dollar cost average over the years. And then I think 2015, um, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Or Robert Kiyosaki, obviously yes, a, a, mon a, a monster book. So I think it's a, a cornerstone for a lot of people just in the investing space. And it, it, it started to answer the questions of like, why am I investing? Like the yeah. why of it. It's not, it's, yeah, it is about the 8% a year and everything else. And like, we need, like, you know, people tell you that you need to invest. And like, but why did my stepfather tell me that I needed to invest? Like, what's the need of it? So yeah. like, and that's, and just flipping it upside down for me in the quadrants that he did. Um, 2015, that was a really important time, I think, just going through that book. Yeah, I read that much later. I know probably 2019 or 2020. I, I think 2020 during the pandemic, I really hunkered down with reading. You can see a lot of the books that I got here mm -hmm. that I completed. Um, and, you know, I just kind of, that you were not going out to bars, not going places. So I kind of hunkered down and did a lot of reading. And I definitely advise that for anyone. I know it's funny when you're reading things, a lot of times it, it's dated by comparison to the internet where it's instantaneous and you have more data. But a lot of the concepts are what I really recommend in a lot of the books that you see. Um, yeah, and it's very interesting, you know, the stats are kind of shocking when you hear like, you know, 50% of people have less than $100,000 saved up for retirement. And that's like of all ages, whether you're, you know, 65, all the way down to mm -hmm. just starting at 18. And that's kind of scary, because even if you think if you had 100,000, that's definitely not enough to live off of for 10, 20, you know, 30 years, if you, if you live that long, retiring at 65 and living to 95. I know that'd be a long life, but it, it is it's sad that our schooling system or our education system just definitely fails people. You know, they definitely get an F in that regard to investing and your money and why it's important and why you should do it. Um, I don't know if that's by choice or by design. Uh, that's up for debate. But uh, yeah, any comments or thoughts on that? Yeah, the fiat education. Got to steal it from safety. <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. So obviously safety of the moose. So if you haven't read the Bitcoin standard, that's obviously a go-to. We talked about it on the podcast a couple months ago, obviously. Uh, but a cornerstone for any Bitcoiner to kind of go down their journey. That's a top five read probably, I would say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got, I probably, you know, I probably steal a lot of stuff from safety and, <laughs> and all this stuff and like, you know, this Fiat standard book coming out and things like that. But yeah, you're mentioning like the Fiat education and I do think it's on purpose, just like Robert talks about in his books, um, you know, that they want to educate you in a way that you are, you, you get on that hamster wheel, you know, they mm -hmm. spin the hamster wheel, the Fiat system spins the wheel and they want to slam you on that wheel. So you yeah. run as fast as you can and become a product of the system, essentially. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, obviously Bitcoin is like the antithesis of that. Exactly. And, you know, I guess, so with the level of experience, so obviously what, when did you start the podcast and then what was the kind of extent? And then now kind of getting to the Bitcoin side of things, what ultimately drove you to get into the Bitcoin point? Was it a certain time or, you know, 2015 when you're reading uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or was it later in 2018 or, you know, 2020 when everyone's eyes really opened up? Yeah, 20, I think 2016 was the first time. I mean, I, I was told about it by a friend of mine uh, that came in town from California. Uh, it, it was kind of around those spaces in LA and things like that. Now, I'm from Kentucky, so <laughs> there wasn't a lot of, you know, uh, talk around uh, Bitcoin around these spaces around here. So I, I think a lot of times you just kind of get, you kind of, you're a product of your environment. 
you know, and, and, and um, so my cousin was involved, you know, in, in, in LA and came in, tried to talk about Bitcoin and I just completely dismissed it. Like, like a lot of people did. Um, but 2016, it was the first time I really saw a price chart. And uh, for 14 and 15 was like the first time I really started looking at charts and trying to understand just, you know, TA in general, um, because price action really tells a story over the long term, yeah. um, over monthly charts. And, and I love going back and, and I would encourage everyone uh, to look at, the, look at the Dow Jones. I mean, you can go all the way back. If you look, look at, I think, DJIA and go back to 1910, 1920, 1930, and like what happened during the Great Depression. And it, it, it just tells this beautiful story of a price action because um, yeah. a lot of people only look back 10 years. We'll go back and look six or seven decades. Um, and you just look at, you know, the, the, the overall, overall price action. Um, and I, th I think that's important. Well, sorry, what we were going with that? Yeah, uh, no, I think that's awesome. I, I think I was going for how you kind of started up the level up experience and then how it ultimately led you to Bitcoin. Yeah, so, so, so that was the first I saw price action. It was right around, um, there was a lot of hype going around the, the ETF. I mean, and, and obviously there's ETF craze right now around Bitcoin, but back in 2016, that was when a lot of hype was trying to come in and a lot of, um, you know, I don't have it offhand, but there was a lot of uh, people registering for the ETF. And so the price action was around like 800, 900, 1,000. It was retesting highs from 2013. So any, any TA, any chartist whatsoever knows that if an asset, you know, consolidated for two or three years and retested those previous highs from just a couple of years ago, that, you know, it, it puts it just on price action alone, it puts it on people's on the radar. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what happened with the price action in Bitcoin. And it, it obviously broke above, you know, I think right around the, the 1200 mark, which was, you know, depending on what exchange you looked at, but around the 11 or 1200 mark in, two, in early 2017. So that was the first time like price action. I didn't, I did not fundamentally understand it. Um, and really didn't start allocating until, you know, like, you know, summer of 2017. Um, and then just from there, you know, Safe Dean's book in 2018, Bitcoin Standard was a huge turning point uh, to understanding as, you know, not just a portfolio allocation, but also as, as money and unit of account and then monetary history. Um, and then just some, and other reads as well, just trying to get a good fundamental history of like just what Bitcoin was, what the technology was. And I think at some point you just hit a certain threshold where it starts to click. And, you know, a lot of people say it on Twitter or wherever you go uh, for your social media, but um, like you can't unsee it. And then at that point, you see an entirely new system uh, compared to the fiat system that you mentioned earlier. Um, so that and I've, I've also got, you know, other interests as well uh, in tech in general. Uh, my brother is a top Smash Brothers Melee player in the world. He told um, me and, that in our, <laughs> in our uh, live show. That's awesome. Yeah. So like he's been around esports for many, many years, probably, you know, comp competing competitively probably about seven or eight years. Um, so actually, he was my first um, guest on my show in 2019. So it was like this mix of esports, gaming, tech, startups. I've uh, been involved in several startups myself over the years. And so just kind of putting it all together. Um, and I guess one other thing on, you know, on Bitcoin, I was somewhat, I guess I was like almost, you know, Bitcoin anon in a sense, in a way. Like it wasn't so much on his forefront talking about it at the time in 2019. But I felt like this thing after 2020 happened and we saw all the money printing happening, you know, and I think we talked about this in the podcast, but um, I always forget his last name, you know, but the guy that says we can print as much as we want. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, Kahari ka or something. Kahari, like yeah. I always forget his ka last name. Kashikari or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kashikari, whatever. And, you know, I, I just feel like when he said that, you know, it, it really just, it, it resonated with me and it really just shot through me because it was basically saying, you know, we don't care. Yeah. We're going to do whatever we want. We're going to hurt as many people as we want. We're going to destroy the money of people however we see we want to, you know, however we please. And so, like, I don't know if I feel like this, there was like a moment. It's like, I have to talk about it. Like, and I'm just a pleb. Like, I'm a, <laughs> I'm just Bitcoin a guy with a podcast. Yeah. that talk about Bitcoin. Like, I just enjoy it. Like, you know, but for me, it was like, it, you, you feel like at a certain point, man, we just need to have conversations around it because so many people in, that, that you care about or people around you just don't understand it. Yeah. And, and, and you're not, they're trained to not understand it. Like we mentioned earlier, going back to Riz Ed Poor Dad, um, and just being on the hamster wheel, they want you on the wheel. They don't want you to think about why you're running on the wheel. Um, and, and so I think Bitcoin's part of that, that because you have to understand monetary history and, and money in general and what money is to understand Bitcoin. Yeah, I completely agree. I think you hit on a lot of really good points there. Um, I, I was very fortunate that uh, I, I have a similar story to you. In 2017, I had a, a friend from college or an acquaintance from college that was like, we should all buy this, you know, we'll get rich, blah, blah, blah. And we kind of saw it. I'm like, no, this is like a Ponzi scheme. I literally said, like, this is tulip mania. I'm not doing this. We saw it go up to, you know, 19K or just under 20K and then crash. I was like, oh, I was right. And then, you know, lo and behold, a few years later when 2020 occurred, I actually, uh, I joke that I bought two days after Michael Saylor did. He made the announcement 
in August, but he mm -hmm. said he bought like the day before the Bitcoin conference in 2021 or 2020, he bought like June 3rd and I bought like June 5th or 6th. I actually looked at my receipt. So I just passed my one year Bitcoin anniversary of having it not too long ago. But, you know, there's a lot to learn. And I think like I can say now, especially, you know, 12 year, yeah, 12 years from its inception, that I've been very lucky of how much content that's out there right now, whether it's YouTube's podcasts, Bitcoin, Twitter, whatever it may be. And I definitely go back to what you're saying, like the whether the, the beauty of the internet is kind of like you can make your own circle of people. I know there's that one person that's like, show me your friends and I'll show you your future in a weird way. Like even if you're friends at home or your family at home, you can have a family or friends like on the internet that help increase your knowledge or wealth, wealth of knowledge, basically. Um, I think also going back to, to the point of money, Michael Saylor, I know he's trying to do, you know, the world's greatest sales pitch for why you should buy Bitcoin, why corporations should do it. Uh, he, I know he owns like uh, Saylor, uh, education org or SailorAcademy.org and Hope.com and all those different things. I think the coolest thing that I saw probably in the tail end of last year is when he did the S&P 500 and he literally put the unit's account instead of USD or, or any type of currency, he put it in Bitcoin. And the best companies in the world, you think of Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it may be. And these companies are severely, severely underperforming Bitcoin relative to it. And you can put it in any time frame too, like, you know, in the last five years, in the last four years, last three years, whatever it may be. And Bitcoin's just like crushing them. Yeah, I guess there's some gaps if you want to take some nuance in like 2017 to 2018 or 2013 to 2014. But like when you look at it, like in any time frame, if you want to put from here to here, most likely Bitcoin was destroying any of the, the best companies in the world. And I know there's lots of talk of Kathy Wood. I really respect her. She said in the S&P 500, there's a bunch of companies that are like zombie companies. You know, they're burdened with debt and like they're just scraping by. But because of money printing, they're able to basically just keep up with their debt obligations because of that. And I think that's something that people uh, hitting on your last point, the Federal Reserve, like the reason they hurt so many people and people don't realize it, like the money printing only benefits the people with the assets. And like, yeah, I guess you and I can look and say, we own Bitcoin, we own stocks, we own a house, whatever it may be, the, a the assets we have, um, they are appreciating. But when you think about it, it, even though it affects us and helps us, it more, much greatly helps, you know, Jeff Bezos made like $71 billion in a year where the economy is locked down. Granted, I know everyone was using Amazon because they were at home, but like the money printing definitely pushed that much further in terms of the stock price appreciation and his net worth and his wealth. Yeah. And so that's, that. so the macro for me is doing, doing twofold, doing two things, basically. I think the only two things that will keep up with um, monetary inflation um, or asset inflation, because we all know CPI is a joke and CPI is not 3.4%, even, you know, even though this, it's like a decade high or whatever, we know that doesn't exist. Let's say asset inflation is 20%, 25% plus. And that's going to continue because the money printing has to continue. Like the, it's the acceleration of depreciation of the, of the money. Uh, the more you print, the more you have to print. So you have to ask yourself, well, how can I keep up with it? So I kind of look at it in two buckets. One is, one is Bitcoin. It's pretty simple. <laughs> you just look at uh, the risk you're taking, like the sharp ratio compared yeah. to other assets. It's the has the highest sharp ratio, so essentially, like the, the risk that you're taking uh, is 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 rewarded. Essentially, it's like the easiest way to explain it yep. uh, based yeah. on volatility and upside. So Bitcoin's number one, and like the other bucket you could probably throw in there is is uh, early stage companies, early yeah. stage startups, so private private company investing, um, and then an, an asterisk or like a denominator of that is. Um, startups that are using Bitcoin as a unit of account. So Bitcoin yeah. startups. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you're almost like cheating if you're involved with like Bitcoin startups, you know, because you're using Bitcoin as a unit of account and they're, they're building on top of Bitcoin. It's so like lightning companies, which we can get into in a minute, are building on lightning or building on liquid and things like that. So um, I just put in those two buckets, um, you know, and it just depends on your, just, just kind of who you are, your personality, how you like, if you're more hands-on, you want to get more involved, um, you know, maybe you split that up between the two. Maybe you're, you know, you're just strictly Bitcoin um, or you have a combination of Bitcoin, the asset, and then, you know, uh, Bitcoin startups, essentially. Yeah. And I probably think the only thing else uh, I could throw in that bucket, which is out of reach for 99.99% of people is if you own like a sports team, whether it's in the NFL, NBA, you know, any of those. And that's more of like the billionaire class of, you know, they bought a team and it's appreciating in value, beating the hedge of inflation. 
Uh, it's something that I've noticed, you know, when you're looking at Bitcoin, it's so multidisciplined, whether it's electrical engineering, whether it's cryptography, whether it's, you know, um, socioeconomic, whether it's for, you know, helping countries with remittance. I think something that's really interesting to me with like the Federal Reserve and, you know, not to go into politics of it, but you think in 2009 when Obama raised the minimum wage to, I think, 725 across the nation, but then since then, we have not had a raise in minimum wage, but yet the Federal Reserve every quarter comes out saying, oh, it's 2% inflation. Oh, it's 3.4% inflation. I mean, last quarter was 5.1% in inflation. And that's, that's a number that's manipulated to be lower. I know recently they just came out and Preston Pish was all over this. Uh, you know, I love him from the uh, We Study Billionaires podcast doing the Bitcoin episodes, but they said they're going to be removing commodities from the CPI uh, target. So it, basically they're going to be removing gold, precious metals, platinums. And it's like every time like things get too out of control, they just remove something. Instead of a mortgage, it's rent. Instead of, you know, soon it's going to be instead of a rent, a whole month's rent, it's going to be half a month's rent or whatever it may be. So they're always manipulating that number down. So it benefits, you know, the government. So in their debt obligation, but is it the irony of that? It's been 725, the minimum wage since 2009. And now in 2021, and the minimum wage is still 725. So it's almost funny, like the Federal Reserve is telling you you're getting poorer to your face. And like, I know it's complex with all the numbers, inflation, NAV, all the crazy evaluations, but it's like, they're telling the, the people that are less fortunate or the poor or middle class, like, oh, your minimum wage job, your purchasing power is a fraction of what it used to be in, in uh, 2009. And you're making the same amount in 2021. Yeah. Just one point to that language is so important. Yeah. And it sounds silly for me to say that, but what the words people say carry a lot of weight. There's a reason why they say those things. There's a reason they created CPI is to manipulate you because you yeah. said it. You said it. It's, it's that 3.6% is was not asset inflation. You yeah. know, that, is that in, is that including used cars? Used cars this last year outperformed the S&P 500. Yeah, they were at like 41%, 42%. Lumber was at 60%, yeah. you know, like housing it, it's it was crazy. Housing didn't outperform it, but the things that you're trying to buy when they're getting away from you and you're not getting a raise of 2 or 3%, you're hoping your assets are inflating higher than inflation. And I know Michael Saylor, he even talks about like, what's your inflation? And he always used the number 37. And I was like, I can't figure out what that is. And then I'm like, oh, duh, it's the amount that the S&P 500 went up. It went up 37%. So if you're constantly buying or dollar cost averaging through a 401k, through a brokerage account, whatever it may be, you know, it got 37% more expensive to buy the top 500 companies in the United States. And he makes a great point. Like, you know, you're basically getting priced out of that as much as a house and all that. And then he's like, yeah, if you're taking away the, the risk factor or, or if you're, um, you're basically doing, uh, what's it called? Uh, man, I'm drawing a blank on it. Basically, when you're subtracting how much of the money supply has expanded, if you're subtracting the 25%, yeah, the S&P 500 is up. Discounting, uh, yeah. The, yeah, the, discount. the, the discounted cash flow, thank yeah. you. Yeah, if you're subtracting the 25% that we've printed in the last 18 months or even more now, you only got a 12% return or 10% return. So that's your real risk adjusted rate is you got 10%. It looks like 37%, but it's really 10% when you say how much you've adjusted the money multiplier or how much money you've put in the system. Exactly. So then you, have, you go back to the, the question, what can you do to keep up? Exactly. Yeah. And unfortunately, I would say I don't. And there's I don't know the number of this, but it seems like to me like eight out of ten people don't even ask the question. Yeah. So if you don't even know what question to ask, you don't know what the answer is. Mm -hmm. So it's just something to think about and, and and really think about it. Like people that are close to you, like how many ask the question, like how do I keep up with asset inflation, mm -hmm. and how many people has actually asked themselves that question? Uh, yeah. it, because more than likely they are on the wheel, the hamster wheel, and it just keeps going and it gets get it gets faster and faster, and then your mind is just focused on running. Yeah. It's not focused on why you're running because <laughs> if, you, if you're sprinting, if someone's making you sprint, right? You're not necessarily asking why, like you're just, you're trying to survive. And you it's know, almost and like you're sprinting on a treadmill and then they just keep turning the dial up on the speed, keep going up. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, you're eventually going to tire out and, and collapse or it's going to get too fast. You're going to fall and hurt yourself. So it, it's sad to say, and you know, there's a lot of speculation about like, it, I don't want to say the apocalypse, but like, we really don't know where we're going to go. Like it's uncharted territory. We've never printed 25% of our currency all at one point. There's mm -hmm. times in history that we can relate to the, always the saying that, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. You know, you could look at France in the late 1700s when they just started printing money. You could look at Weimar Germany after World War II. You can look at all the Roman empire when they were clipping or they're clipping the coins and they're basically, you know, de devaluing their currency. Uh, so I really don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I guess the one thing I can guarantee 
certainty is they're going to keep printing money and they're going to keep speeding up and that there's going to be more civil unrest. And, and I hate saying that because people are going to die. You know, companies are going to die. Like businesses are going to be destroyed. People are going to get hurt. And what comes out the other side, you hope is a stronger, better society, but it's only going to get worse before it gets better. And, and I hate saying that, but I know it to be true. You know, a good read right now. I think everyone should read. It's a very dense read and I'm definitely not the best resource or source to kind of go through all, you know, um, the entire subject line of everything for it. But, you know, When Money Dies is a phenomenal listen. Um, I, I'm going to have to listen to it probably seven times before I can really talk about it coherently. It's very, it's very deep, but it goes, it, it goes through, um, you know, Walmart Germany, uh, what happened in Germany and just how the, how the mark, I mean, like within it, literally within a day, it was just, it was just inflating like in, within a 24 hour period to like nothing and just going through that experience through that. So, and it's, this is not new, you know, every fiat currency has an end to it, Yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, and we don't know, like you, you said it great. Like we don't know when that's going to be, but I do think taking steps to hedge at least at a minimum hedging yourself um, is something that that's really important. Um, and I always talk about like the, we talk about this too, like the progression of, of understanding Bitcoin and like the actions you take with it is typically is like three steps. So the first step is hedging. So I said the word hedge. A lot of people yeah. are in that, oh, okay, hedge, like fidelity. 1%, from, 2%, whatever uh -huh. it may be. Well, I, did you see fidelity just came out a couple days ago? And instead of the 60-40 portfolio, it's like this, you know, the 60-38-2 or whatever. So they're throwing Bitcoin in as a 2%. No way. I did not actually see that. I, I, just, I know, I, I yeah. know Paul Tudor Jones has up, steadily upped his uh, him or Stanley Drunken Miller. They went from, we went to 1% and then <laughs> to you know, early, or early this year, they're like, oh, we're at like two. And then they're like, it's very shortly afterwards, we're actually at 5%. And it's like, okay, we, we like, they're funny because I think that they, I respect them, the Ray Dalyus and all of them, that they are like the, the best, literally the, the guys at the top of their game, the guys and gals at the top of their game. And, you know, we're kind of seeing that them be like, you know, they've been doing this 40, 50 years. And when like their eyes are open up and they're kind of the, the older generation, they realize like, oh, like I've done so well. And I have like the Federal Reserve to thank for that. But at the same time, they're like, I need to escape this. Like I need like a hedge to protect all the money that, that I've, accumulated or or the assets i've uh, accumulated over time yeah like ray dahlia says cash is trash yeah you know yeah. and his and, he, and he's and he's got action behind his words you know and i it, it cannot be overstated that that he owns bitcoin <laughs> like who have you would have ever thought that you know in 2019 if you said ray dahlia owned bitcoin you'd be like yeah right there's no way he owns bitcoin yeah, you know I, but, <laughs> I can, but, it I just, but it's, it's accelerated so much you know as the as the money printing has accelerated it's accelerated adoption because what the smart what the smart people know and here this is a really big point sometimes you have, you just have to simplify things yeah and when you understand I, and look i'm not an expert on monetary history but i know enough to to see a trend and mm -hmm. that's all you need to know you don't have to be an expert i feel like in certain things you just have to know enough of something and then it it, it just it, it it'll push you to learn more about it yeah. right and then that you get you kind of it's like a seesaw thing at some point it kind of tips over um but humans are converging on a new money now when now i don't lead with that with to no coiners or somebody my friends and stuff because they're like you're quit what are you talking about like this is crazy stuff like it's conspiracy theories and stuff but when you look at monetary history it hasn't always been paper paper fiat like that yeah. hasn't always been money yeah we've had gold we've had silver we've, we've had, had seashells we've had shells we had yeah. whatever it may be yeah mm -hmm. so in humans will converge and in the end the last 12 years more humans are converging on a better money which is bitcoin that's yeah. literally the answer you can take out all the sharp ratios and we can you know i can get super technical with all that stuff or some ta and throw that around but you know you know in stage four stage three and all this stuff none of that matters I think if you have that lens of, oh, wow, human beings are like realizing Bitcoin is the best money and it's the slowly than suddenly, you know, slowly more people are adopting it. Slowly more companies are adopting it on the balance sheet. Slowly more, you know, in a couple of days, El Salvador is adopting yeah. it as legal tender, like a yeah. country is adopting it. So th that's happening. Um, but it's, it's just so surreal to me that it's happening just, it's like so slow but it's fast at the same time. Um, and, and I mean, are... this time last year, was that 9K, 11K, mm -hmm. if that, or what? I think it was probably 11K. So it's like, yeah, well, now we're at 48K right now or 49K. I, I look at it too much, but you know, if you think of that, it's like four, you know, four and a half times increase, 4.8 times increase. That's, that's absurd. That's, you know, 480%, whatever it may be. That's, it's so much, like you said, it's sl slow, uh, suddenly and then quickly or 
Yeah, sl- slowly and suddenly. And it, it's a great, um, you know, Parker Lewis, there's so many great resources, like you said earlier, but Parker Lewis has a great mm-hmm. um, um, series, uh, a blog series, uh, slowly and suddenly. And he's been on what Bitcoin did several times. Uh, and he kind of goes through it you know, in video format. That's a great blog to kind of go through. Um, because there, again, there is, it's just the theme is there's that tipping point. Humans are converging on a better money. Um, and once, once, I mean, just think about it. If you find a better money, are you going to want to give it away? <laughs> you're not, you don't, you don't want to, why would you give away? And that's why you looking on, if you look at some, on, we won't get in, you know, too in, de- in depth on on-chain data, but we look at the on-chain data, the on-chain data is saying, once people understand it, you turn into a long-term hodler. You don't just frivolously give your Bitcoin away yeah. because you understand I, it's the best of money on the planet. Then why in the world would I give it away? And like any asset, there's going to be right. traders for it. So, you know, yeah. a lot of stuff, they call them the short-term hodlers or hodlers. Yeah. You know, you see a lot of movement there. You know, it goes yeah. up, they get dump it, it goes down. They're like, oh, I was right, but then it keeps going up. But I think the last reports of like, I think it was like 60 to 68% or almost 70% of people of the long-term holders, I think you have to be over six months or a year, yes. have not moved their Bitcoin at all. And then of that, like, like 58% are longer than a year or two. So it's like, you see that this large chunk of people, like they'll let the other people do whatever they want with their money. It's their money, your investment, you can do whatever you want. But it's, it's like exactly you said, the harder form of money is appearing. And people are like, I'd rather sell my house. I'd rather liquidate my stocks. I'd rather, you know, cash in my bonds at a loss. The, the negative yielding bonds, that, that's even a joke. And uh, I know, uh, do you follow Greg Foss? You must. Yes, Greg, absolutely. Greg, Greg <laughs> Foss, hit some of his stuff. It's just so funny. Him being, uh, for those that don't know or don't follow on Bitcoin Twitter, uh, Greg Foss, he was a 35-year bond trader or a, you know, long-term bond trader. And uh, basically, he's seen like in his market, uh, the stock market is kind of dictated by the bond market. It's the debt markets and the credit markets. So the debt market, basically, when you see it it moving, that's normally makes the the assumption that the stock market will follow or the housing market will follow. And he basically sees that when, you know, of $126 trillion of uh, global bonds or, or corporate government bonds and all that, he sees $18 trillion of it is negative yielding, meaning that if you hold it to completion, whether it's 10 years, you know, I, I'm going to loan Chris a hundred dollars. And at the end of it, he only has to give me $98. And then on top of that, the that's $98 that he gives back on top of the fact that we're inflating the money supply. So not only is the $98 negative, it's less what with inflation, it's even lower than that in terms of purchasing power. So it's crazy. Exactly. And you just said, I mean, there's almost 20, tr- 20 trillion with a T. Yeah. And, and that, and that bad debt, essentially, well, how, how, how Greg Foss talks about it, it's, you know, toxic debt just sitting there, 20 trillion. And Bitcoin's market cap's, you know, 800 billion, which is absolutely nothing. Yeah. You know, so that's, why, and it's, I love it. He says, it, it's very, because lang- I mentioned earlier, like, language is very important for like the way you say things uh, to simplify things. And I, just so many people say, have, have their own way of saying it. That's why I think listening to podcasts are important because you might hear something like seven times from some people, but like the seventh time you heard from someone else, They'll say it in a different way, you know, and like, you know, Greg, Greg said, you know, there's a rounding error with Bitcoin. And I thought that was a really cool one. I'm like, oh, it's interesting. Rounding error. What does he mean by that? And he said, you know, basically they're just, there's a round, we're missing a zero. <laughs> On the back end of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, because again, because go, I mean, and this is another, see, I think some people just need like pillars. They need like, you know, five to 10 pillars of like, why, like just why Bitcoin. Right. And then one of the other early narratives is, you know, digital gold. I mean, the properties of Bitcoin, it's, it's a better, it's just a better form of money. And when you understand what money is and you understand the, you know, the properties like divisibility, scarcity, and all those things put together, Bitcoin is better. The only thing that it's not is the longevity of the asset. That's it. Yeah. That's it. So you're basically just front running because you have the knowledge and the conviction to have that before other people. That's really the arbitrage. It's just the information arbitrage. And then, so if it's a, if it's a better money, you adopt it earlier than other people uh, and you think it's better than gold. I think it's 10 times better than gold. Yeah. Because you have technology built on top of it, which we can kind of translate, you know, transition into lightning a little bit. But um, so if it's better than gold, I mean, it's just simple math. If it's better than gold, Bitcoin should be 500K, 600K. That's where it should be right now for to, to you know, uh, kind of be in, in, in tandem with gold's market cap. So and I, I hate to, I don't want to simplify it too much. I'm not saying it's going there next week, but I'm just saying if you, if you believe that, if you think, believe it's the best money available and the best way to store wealth, then there's a 10X upside just for that benchmark. Yeah. And uh, I like Sailor's analogy. It's actually a billion time improvement. And this is the way that he said it. If you want to move 
five billion dollars worth of gold or no uh yeah no uh a billion dollars worth of gold it's about twenty five thousand pounds i'm I'm doing a rounding error but it's like twenty two thousand whatever it is let's just say twenty five uh thousand pounds and you to move a billion dollars worth of gold you're gonna have to pay for security you're gonna have to pay for planes if you want to move it from new jersey where i live to california for whatever reason you know i'm moving i want to store my wealth with me so you got to hire planes you got to hire security you got to like pay for the fuel you got to uh, have forklifts to move this stuff in and on the, the just at the airport you have to get it from the bank to the airport airport to other airport and all these different things so to move a billion dollars worth of gold twenty five thousand pounds it's about a thousand hour exercise and it takes about five million dollars like rough estimate with the cost of logistics planes weight all those different things if you want to move a billion dollars worth of, of bitcoin it would take five dollars in an hour so it's a million time improvement on the cost, five million to five dollars, and then in times, in time, it's a thousand hours to one hour. So just like, like it's a billion time improvement. You know, a thousand times a million, it's a billion times better than gold. And obviously, that's just discounting. That's just moving value over time and space. That's excluding, you know, the, the usability of it. I find it really funny when Peter Schiff says how gold is so much better, and I really see gold and silver having. Uh, a use case in an apocalyptic scenario, the internet goes down. You know, God forbid there's an EMP pulse that takes out the internet, satellites, whatever it may be, that like barter is automatically go to cash and or uh, gold. And the cash only if it isn't hyperinflated by this point. But the gold and silver definitely has value because it's like an object that you can have until the time that the network comes back online for Bitcoin. But Bitcoin alone, you know, if you look at remittance payments, you know, Western Union's always saying, oh, it's only really 1% or half a percent. That's true if you're moving a million dollars from the United States to El Salvador. But if you want to move $100, the fees, I looked at it, it can be upwards of $30, $35, $40. Mm-hmm. That's a 40% to a 30 to 40% haircut on the money that you're trying to send back to the family help. If you want to move $100 of Bitcoin uh, to your family down there, I think it's like fractions of a cent. It's like, you know, maybe six cents max when there's a high volume. It can be fractions of a penny on like low volume with, in terms of usage. And even if you open up a lightning channel, it can be near and instantaneous. So it's just, it's really hard to fathom. You know, it, you know it's demonetizing, uh, you know, money basically, which is yeah, crazy. And then another good read is uh, Check Your Financial Privilege by Alex Gladstein. Uh, okay. And just how and just how uh, Bitcoin is going to change the lives of so I mean just hundreds of thousands and millions of people, um, especially in developed nations. Um, and quite frankly, they get overlooked. They get overlooked. They do. I, they, they they get overlooked. But, you know, and it, it, this is what kind of fire, it fires me up because it you know Bitcoin is the is bottom up because mm-hmm. I think it's yes, pe- yes. You know, people that have the people that are living through their money being destroyed. You know, or living in a country where they had a bail-in with Cyprus. Did you know? Did people forget about Cyprus? Yeah. In 2012, they had a bail-in. People, I mean, literally just stole their money from them. Like, yeah, you know, a haircut. I don't know what the haircut was. Like 25 percent or whatever overnight. It's like, oh, if you had 100 dollars, by the way, it's only 75. We just took 25 percent of it, or whatever it was. You know, and and but people just forget that slash the check your financial privilege. I think it was a great title by Alex Gladstein because you know if you're you know if you're in the U.S. You know, you're on your little high horse and you're like, oh, I don't, you know, who cares? You know, my business is going well and blah, 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 you know, and, and it's, you have to check your financial privilege. And that's sad. I, you know, I think, so I, I laugh because there was a short window where, because I talked about like just, you know, I've always enjoyed investing, things like that. There was a short window where I was wanting to get into wealth management. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of right in that moment of like where, where Bitcoin was just a, like kind of took over my mindset. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. It was like, yeah. it, was, it was more like uh, back then it was more like Bitcoin's an asset but not unit of account yet. It was like, I was yeah, step two yeah. versus yep. step three. And, but I would, all I could talk about was I would, I could just, I just talked about it all the time with the other partners and they're like, Oh, I'll quit talking about that. No one cares. No client wants to talk about that stuff or whatever. Um, Cause I got my series 65 uh, as well for those that are in the okay. space or know that. So yeah, yeah. For investment advisory. <laughs> and, uh, but then we went to a conference, very long story short, it's a good story, but um, went to a conference um, and I was, you know, talking about Bitcoin, everybody. And they're just like, quit talking about that. No one cares about it. You know, and they're all, they're all, you know, 60 plus the 55 plus they've got, you know, AUM, you know, 500 million AUM, whatever, all, all yeah. this, just hundreds of advisors there and they're just writing off. Well, here comes day two. And guess who was there day two? Uh, ARK Investment. No way. So ARC was there and this was 2019 and they did a beautiful presentation on two things. They did it on Bitcoin for about 20 minutes and they did it on uh, Tesla. 
in 2019. That's Basically, crazy, man. And they <laughs> well, because what they were doing, they, they were pushing their funds. Yeah. This is when they were really pushing ARKK and some of the ETFs and yeah. some of the, the and funds. And then Kathy so. Wood went on the best tear of like 2019 <laughs> to 2020 and 2021. Exactly. It was just funny because all the people I was try- talking big- Bitcoin, see, this was, Bitcoin was around like 8K or so. You know, it was in that sideways motion. No yep, one yep. cared. It was dying or whatever. And, you know, but then, and here comes, they did a beautiful job just presenting the fund and, you know, what was inside the, the active ETF, or whatever. And um, they talk, talk about GBTC because that's what the exposure was with the GBTC yeah, inside yeah, the fund. Yeah. <laughs> and then after I'm like, what do y'all think now? And they just kind of laughed. And then a few of them actually put that in, put in their model portfolios after that, after their presentation. Did they so you get it, any phone calls saying thanks for <laughs> this year or last year? I ha- actually I have from that same for, yeah they uh they actually had a um, a client have a few questions that I talked to to kind of he did he just had some general questions about some things and uh, and I'm not actively advising or anything but you know they had some questions of just because they couldn't answer it and here you know you're a you you are a wealth manager and you can't answer a question you can't spend two sentences talking about Bitcoin because you don't care enough yeah. you should care enough if you're a wealth manager you better be able to have three sentence conversation with someone but most of them don't because they're arrogant. Yeah. I, I went through this. Like they're arrogant. They don't want to put in the time. They don't want to learn about it because it completely changes their business and they have to learn something else. Yeah. They'd rather stick their clients in bonds and their old models because they don't do any work. The, the way that I look at this right now is it's literally the second coming of the internet. And it's like hard to fathom, you know, people are laughing and uh, I love the clips of like uh, NBC or CNN or whatever it is. And the newscasters are like, oh, there's a thing. I, what, what's that A with the circle? Is that an at? You know, no, this internet thing, it's like in 1993 and they're like, what, what's the internet? Like, no, this isn't going to help business. And now it's like not even 30 years later. And it's like, if you don't have an internet business, like, I don't know how you make money. You know what I mean? Even if you're a retail store, even if you're whatever business, like you've got to have a, a social media aspect and a, a, a website. And that's like the do fa- that you're behind. That's just the basis. So it, it's, it's funny. Yeah, but, yeah. And, 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 and it's, this is related, but not related at the same time. But like with, I mean, with Facebook, I was in college. I was a freshman when Facebook came out. It was called the Facebook. And you had to have an, I'll never forget. You had to have an edu, a dot edu email. You had to have an email with a school to be on the Facebook or whatever. I'll never forget that. Like 2005. I've been through this. I've been through Twitter. I've been through. So if you if you've just paid attention, you didn't even have to be you know investors. You know in, in like you know a, a you know a seed stage company that you know you didn't have to you didn't have to be Peter Thiel or anything like that to know and look back because you were probably a consumer of those things. You know, and then so if you just look at that, it's the same thing. It's the same. It's the same thing happening over and over and over again. And here we are. But this but this transition is the is the biggest transition that we've ever seen for hundreds and hundreds of years because we're going from a from one money to the next. And the, another law to look up, I always try to mention this, uh, Thier's Law. Thier's Law is really interesting. I, I was going to mention it earlier and I got sidetracked a little bit, but Thier's Law is, is the, the good money, the best money available is pushing out the bad money. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what that's exactly what's happening because people are adopting good money. And, and what you're also seeing slowly is merchants. They're going to demand Bitcoin. They're, they already are. They're, they're saying we are accepting it. That's kind of the that's kind of the mantra the last couple of years. But eventually they're going to say, look, we don't want your fiat. We want Bitcoin because that's the money. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, and so and that's that suddenly then suddenly more and more merchants are going to say, look, all we take is Bitcoin. It's going to happen, you know. And so all that's really interesting. But the is like a really interesting because there's Gresham law, which is kind of the opposite. Um, but yeah, look up Thier's law. I think it's something to really kind of understand a little bit. That's cool. I'll definitely check that out. Uh, any other points you want to touch on before we start getting into the wrap up here? You know, I, oh, one thing I wanted to say was, um, I think people discount, um, using Bitcoin because yeah. it's one thing to know, like the financial model of it, um, that, okay, it needs to be a part of a portfolio and like you understand sharp ratio and all that great stuff. But if, if you've never used it, yeah, and I don't just in. I'm just shocked. I think it's. <laughs> I kind of laugh a little bit because I think it's quite frankly, and I, some people get mad when I say this, but like people don't like to do the work. Yeah, <laughs> and I've coached kids every you know from five years old up to college. Like it, it's it's making people do work uh, is sometimes very difficult. It's hard. It's tough. It's not easy. So, yeah. So yeah, I think people just get intimidated. They want to turn their mind off because. Um, it is not, it's not, especially if I don't necessarily have a developer mind. So I know for me, it's, it's, it is difficult. Um, but you just, you have to push yourself. It's just with like with your health and fitness, you know, you don't look, you don't feel like, you know, <laughs> doing sprint intervals, uh, every day that you're supposed to do them or whatever, or train at a very high level every single day when you're with your team or whatever, but you just do it. Like you do it, you know, 
uh, not just for yourself, but for your teammates and your coaches and things like that. It's kind of the same. It's kind of the same thing. I think if you have a longer term view and even outside of yourself, like, especially if you have kids, I think, I think me having kids actually pushed me to learn more about Bitcoin too, because generational, like, what am I going to be able to, to say for my more, kids? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and because that's important, I think maybe if it, it gives you a different perspective um, because you're not, you, you have a generational, um, you know, aspect to it. I don't know if that makes any sense. That does. It does. And uh, Bitcoin, I, it's, it's for everyone. I know there's a recent quote <laughs> that I heard that I, I had never heard. Bitcoin's for enemies, meaning it's like for everyone. <laughs> and, you know, in this day and age with everything being so politicized, like literally everything's a, a left and right issue. It, it, I hate to see that because it's like, you don't realize this, this, this helps the left, the right, the center, the up, the down. It, it helps whatever, you know, race, origin, creed, sex, whatever it may be, it, it, it helps everyone. And, you know, I think you make a great point of, you know, we, we are very fortunate in the United States and even the G7 nations, you know, England or the, the UK, you know, the Germanys, the Chinas, the United States, and even China, you could say under the regime that they live. But, you know, we're very lucky being the, the biggest nations, but the Argentinas, the Venezuelas, the Cyprus, the Syrias, the Iran, the Afghanistan, like I can list a bunch of nations that are very unlucky in, in, in or even Greece, you know, uh, just very unlucky in, in the way that their country set up and way their GOP is set or the uh, not G GDP is set up. And, you know, you see those countries adopting Bitcoin because it's lifting their people out of poverty. You know, when you hear like people can't fathom that some people live on in some of the poorer countries on a dollar a day or less, like, if, if I said, I'm going to give you a dollar an hour that you'd be pissed in the United States, a dollar a day. And I know with currencies, you know, it's, it's different what you can buy with that currency, but we are very privileged. And like you said, check your financial privilege that, you know, how lucky we are that the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency. It, it, I don't believe that as a good currency. It's collapsing. And what even another good thing I heard, you know, with El Salvador, the reason they're adopting it is they didn't get a bailout. You know, the, the, the $1,200, the $600, the, uh, all the, the stimulus money or the $1,400 stimulus checks, like they got zero. They literally got zero and their purchasing power got that much more deflated because not only were they not getting money, they need U.S. dollars because they're a dollarized country. So as the dollars were inflating, it cost them more money to buy the dollars that we were printing freely in the United States. And, yeah, you know, no. we're really, not only did we impoverish our own people in the United States, we further pushed the, these other, you know, less, um, less beneficial nations. So like, you know, you think of how bad our recession was in terms of, you know, what the actual financial markets were saying, what actually was happening, you know, in the world, in the United States, it, think of that, multiply that by 10, five, you know, however many times you want to do it, it was much worse in those countries. Yeah. And to find, you know, to wrap that up, it's just, you know, Bitcoin's the way out. Yeah. And it's all obviously it's, it's kind of a memeish kind of thing to say, but it really is. I mean, and, and all the kind of the one liners in Bitcoin mean a lot. <laughs> yeah. They really do. It's, Bitcoin fixes this and everything else. But, you know, I, all those are, it's just really important to understand Bitcoin is a way out. It, it's an escape route. Like Alex Fetsky says it a lot. Um, it, it really is. And it gives them an, another option because they otherwise they didn't have an option. Yeah, they just didn't have another option because but now there's a new money. There's a fairly new money. It's 12 years old, but there's a better money available to them that they can escape to. So that's and and everyone's not going to rush to those doors immediately at the same time. You know, it's just a yeah. realization and it takes it just takes time. time it just takes time effort. to adopt. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Uh, okay. You know, but yeah. So I think that's a great point. Uh, Chris, thank you once again for coming on. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess what are, what are your goals and aspirations for the level up experience? You're going to kind of keep doing the Bitcoin thing, you know, uh, keep doing on that and, you know, trying to help people in any which way you can. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's kind of started when I started doing more uh, on the Bitcoin content. Um, Alex Vetsky was one of the first um, guests. It was, it, it's, and uh, we kind of went through um, Bitcoin as, as morality uh, Bitcoin help, you know, checking your financial privilege kind of thematic aspect of it. Um, Bitcoin as the asset. But what I'm trying to shift into now is um, what's being built on top of Bitcoin. So I'm kind of bringing in gaming as well. Um, yeah. So I had Zebedee on a few months ago uh, and they've integrated Bitcoin into CSGO for any CSGO yes, players. I, I heard about this. Yeah. Um, so check out Zebedee, Z-E-B-E-D-E-E. -E -E. It's really awesome. So the best way to explain it, you know, they're, they're taking AAA title games and they're putting Bitcoin in it. And it's seamless. It's real time because it's built with lightning. Or it's built on lightning. So everything's happening. You know, if I get a kill, I got to go uh, pick up a coin and that coin is uh, some sats. You know, it could be 50 sats, 100 sats. 
uh, and they have servers running. Um, and so, you know, they've got, they've got, they've got it built from the ground up. Some games are like, they're kind of like Mario Kart and you're picking up sats as you drive and things like that. Um, or they've got it actually integrated uh, with their technology called Infuse in, that they actually integrate it into a triple A title game. Um, Cause that's the biggest thing. If your game isn't fun, no one's going to play it. You yeah. know, so they're yeah. kind of, they're, they're, they're going about it two different ways. And there's other uh, Satoshi's games, another company that's uh, they're building an MMO that has yeah. a Bitcoin integrated into it. It's almost like a wow feel. Uh, it's gonna, and it's happening really fast. And I'm surprised that more people don't know about it. But again, it's that exposure thing. It's just, you've got to kind of search for it and put time into finding these things. Yeah. Um, so I, what I'm shifting into now is like how, what's being built on top of Bitcoin on layer two and layer three. Um, and then also, uh, you know, another company to look at, uh, look out for is Impervious AI. Uh, I've got a couple pretty good friends on, on that team and, you know, they sent an audio file, like it was like a five second audio file and they sent it basically like on layer three of Bitcoin. It's fascinating. And so wow. they said they sent it through the lightning network. So it was like a five second audio file and it was like pieces of the audio file that was sent individually that was then put together and you listen to an audio file all on, on lightning and what someone built like a telephone system. Like? It's, it's really, it's, and I can't really explain it very well. Uh, I'm still learning myself. Um, and then I run my own lightning node. Now I'm trying to learn as much of that, like balancing channels and things like that. So uh, yeah. Plebnet is another really good, I'm trying to have Plebnet on uh, for them to come in. They've got like 3000 people in Telegram, uh, basically connecting their nodes with each other and routing payments and things like that. Yeah, that's awesome. I know uh, Ben and I started up a, a, a service that we're building Bitcoin nodes for people. So, you know, uh, we built a, our first one very recently for a customer and it went pretty seamlessly. So it's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. And then once they, you know, gaming is an absolutely, mad, it's bigger than the film industry. Um, oh, yeah. And, and, you know, all combined and um, the film and music industry combines like $160 billion. So, you know, think, once, once Bitcoin's integrated into something like that, which is happening, you know, it really is. Um, it's just going to happen all of a sudden because, because more publishers are going to do it. So I think there's something crazy. I think GTA 5 made more money than all the Star Wars movies ever. Like all, like everything in Star Wars from 71 to now, GTA made in like the six years or seven years it's been out, however long it's been out. GTA 5 has made more money than all of, like basically you could have Star Wars, or you could have GTA 5 and you would have made more money if you picked GTA 5. Which, yeah, and you know, it's just, Star it'll Wars. Just... Everyone loves it. Like it's. And, but, you know, and, and, and it overlays with when people just, when enough people demand a Bitcoin enough, publishers will be forced to integrate Bitcoin into their game. Yeah. It'll yeah. just, you know what I'm saying? Like, so all of that we talked about is connected. It's so fascinating, you know? So I'm just, I'm just really curious. I'm just trying to keep up because every, every day or something new, it's impossible to keep up. It's like the podcast, I'm trying to cheat a little bit, you yeah. know, to have people on talk about it. That's funny. All right. So Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. So before I get you to go, I know Ben and I normally ask the same question. So uh, what's your biggest investment or business mistake? Uh, it can be about Bitcoin. It can be not about Bitcoin. It can be about whatever. I, I think probably probably Bitcoin and just not um, get, getting higher conviction earlier, you yeah. know, back in the six or seven, seven hundred dollar range, because back then it was just another chart. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it was just another price, just another asset. And you can easily fall into that. Like, you know, a chart is a chart. If you're a chartist, you don't care what it is. And I kind of fell into that neutral mindset of not understanding the fundamentals earlier. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. So I know you mentioned a couple of books and podcasts and stuff like that on this, but what's your favorite book, podcast, YouTube channel, or website that you like to go for investing information specifically about Bitcoin or about anything? Oh man. Um, yeah, I, I would say I got, I got to go back to when money dies um, just because I'm, I'm in my own journey with that book. It is so in depth. Uh, but I think if you, the more you learn about what's happened in monetary history, the more you'll understand what Bitcoin is. Mm -hmm. And not that other things are, there's other things that are important, like technicals and things like that about, about the technology. But um, I think if you understand the monetary history and then how, what has happened to fiat and what's ha what happened to Rome, what happened to coin clipping um, yeah. when the government started doing that and, and what's happened to civilizations once they've either printed money or they've degraded the money, you know, they debased the money in some way. Um, that, that's just really important to understand that. Um, yeah. And then just, and then one last thing, obviously, and I should have said earlier, but obviously there's 21 million. You know, there will never be any more they, they can fork Bitcoin as much as they want. It doesn't matter. Uh, oh, the, the, how oh, was it? The fork, what fork wars? What's that? What's that? That's another a block uh, size wars. The block, block size, size wars. wars is another really good uh, book that I'm actually starting and everything for myself um, to kind of under, just understand those things. And then from there, um, you know, really, I just want to encourage people to, to actually use it, like build a lightning node. Uh, you know, with the umbral or, or, or my node or something and just get, kind of get your hands dirty and kind of really understand the technology more. And I think it'll just give you more conviction. Definitely. 
Uh, like I said, we offer the service. We can build notes for the people that don't feel confident in doing themselves. So, nice. uh, or we can help anyone, e even if you don't want to go through us, we will gladly help anyone that uh, wants to learn or wants help with building it. Uh, we'd love to do it, you know, whether it's across Zoom or whatever. Uh, and then last one. Uh, so thanks so much for coming on. Uh, but if someone wanted to learn more about you or your business, where should they go to find out more or the Level Up Experience podcast? Yeah, uh, Twitter is a good place. It's at the Level Up EXP. It's at the Level Up EXP. Uh, I'm Christopher Reed, C-R-I-S-T-O-P-H-E-R, no H, uh, which by the way, it's funny. Uh, Chris Carter and Chris Collinsworth, two like Hall of Fame receivers in the NFL, spell it C-R-I-S. That's funny. I, I knew them. Chris Collinsworth. I didn't know Chris Carter. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. I'm Christopher with an H. So, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm the odd man out there. Yeah, I didn't make it to the, I, was, I was not an NFL or Rob receiver. So <laughs> not close. So, but yeah, I, uh, just, a, just a thought there. Because um, a lot of people try to look at my name, they put the H in it. So, <laughs> yeah. So thanks, Chris, for coming on. Uh, like you said, everyone, thanks for listening. Uh, you can obviously go to our website, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, you name it. Uh, like I said, if you want to listen to the, or you want to, purchase a Bitcoin lightning node or a node, uh, Ben and I are offering that service. So you can go to our website. It should be under Bitcoin nodes or, you know, the amateur investors.squarespace.com backslash services. So thanks everyone. Have a good one. Talk to you later.